Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I am your host, David Delk. Our guests today are Elizabeth Swagger and Benjamin Garretts. Elizabeth is the Executive Director of Oregon Fair Trade Campaign, and Benjamin is the Prevention with Positives Coordinator at the Cascade AIDS Project here in Portland. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, David. Right, yeah. So what I, what I wanted to uh, do today is uh, is to capture what the two of these uh, individuals said at a recent forum. It was a People's Assembly on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there was a panel uh, presentation by four people. Elizabeth and Benjamin were two of them. So, um, so we're just going to ask each of them to do their presentations as they did it uh, for, the, for the program there at the First Unitarian Church. So with that, uh, let's go first to Elizabeth and have her talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Thanks, David. One of the major purposes of free trade agreements is to make it easier for corporations to shift jobs throughout the globe to wherever it's most profitable. Oftentimes that means moving jobs to uh, where working people are the most repressed and enforcement of environmental regulations are weakest. We have a situation where workers in the United States are forced to compete with workers in Mexico. Workers in Mexico are forced to compete with workers in China. Workers in China are now forced to compete with workers in Vietnam. It's a downward spiral. And at the same time, we're fed this line about how free trade is going to raise all boats, level the playing field, and ultimately benefit people in all countries involved. Now, this might sound familiar to some of you who were around during the Clinton administration. Unfortunately, we're still hearing the same line after 20 years of failed trade policy. And how has current trade policy failed us? The North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, um, and all other free trade agreements that have followed and been modeled after NAFTA have been a disaster for our economy, our environment, and just about everyone but the 1%. We've seen massive job loss, displacement by forced migration, consolidation of our food supply into corporate giants, wiping out smart, small farmers, um, soaring medicine prices, attacks on environmental policies, undermining the democratic structures that put them in place. Currently, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP, is being negotiated between the United States, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Canada, and uh, Japan joining talks as early as July. Just amongst those 12 countries, this is already way bigger than NAFTA. But the Trans-Pacific Partnership is going to be even more significant because it's also intended as a docking agreement, meaning other countries can join on over time. It's theoretically open to any country in the Pacific Rim, and it's set to be the largest free trade agreement ever. Many people are referring to uh, this as NAFTA on steroids. Negotiations on the TPP have been underway since 2010 and have basically taken place behind closed doors. They have actually been some of the most secretive trade talks to date with negotiators refusing to release the text to the public. So people whose lives will be most impacted by this trade deal don't get to see what's being negotiated for or negotiated away until after it's complete, at which point it's virtually impossible to make changes. This sort of backroom dealing is completely outrageous, and it doesn't benefit anyone but the people at the very top who have the most access to the negotiators. And while you and I are barred from reviewing the negotiating documents, approximately 600 corporate lobbyists have official advisory status. It allows them regular access to the negotiating texts and the negotiators. Trade talks on the TPP are far more secretive than trade negotiations led even under the Bush administration. What we know about the TPP and the U.S. proposals is cold from um, conversations that we've had with negotiators and lobbyists um, and from a few chapters of texts that have been leaked. 
Well, we know about the U.S. proposal for labor standards in the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that they're essentially the same as what we got under George W. Bush. Better than NAFTA in that they're actually written into the document, but the standards are extremely vague and they're difficult to enforce in practice. And they're completely inadequate to actually protect workers' rights in places like Vietnam or Brunei, where governments forbid union organizing. One of the few chapters of the TPP that has been leaked is the intellectual property chapter. Now, this chapter contains rules governing patents, rules that have long been advocated for by large pharmaceutical companies. Now, I know Benjamin's going to go into this further, but basically the U.S. proposal has all sorts of provisions that would both literally and effectively extend the length of drug patents, making it harder for countries to approve the production or purchase of generic medications. This means longer access to government-imposed monopoly pricing from drug companies. One other chap chapter that I want to mention um, that was also leaked is the investment chapter. A wide range of corporations have pushed for provisions in the Trans-Pacific Partnership that would allow, the transna would allow transnational corporations to challenge virtually any law, regulation, or even court decision that may negatively impact cross-border trade or even cross-border investment. This has allowed multinational corporations to undermine environmental protections, food and public health regulations, land use policies, and more. There's all sorts of other chapters in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but those are a few examples of where this thing is headed and why it's so dangerous for us to let this thing continue being negotiated in the shadows. U.S. negotiators are pushing hard to complete the TPP negotiations by a set October deadline. Now, that doesn't give us much time. And we've recently seen a big push from the Chamber of Commerce and other big business groups for our elected officials to review fast track for the TPP so that they can slide a bad deal through. Fast Track is federal legislation that would lock in the secretive negotiating process for the TPP into place, allowing the executive branch to conclude negotiations and sign the pact before the public ever sees any of the text, and then present it to Congress for a take it or leave it vote that would forbid amendments to fix even the simplest of problems. The public would have no meaningful say over the content of the trade deal and Congress would be giving up a huge part of its leverage. Senator Wyden has really been outspoken on the issue of transparency because people across the state have let him know how urgent this is. Um, and because of community pressure, he's led the way in pushing the U.S. Uh, negotiators to make their trade proposals public and has gone as far as to publicly challenge the U.S. trade representative, the former U.S. trade representative, on clo their closed door policy. Um, since then, every member of Oregon's congressional delegation, aside from Walden, has signed a letter to the president asking for greater transparency. Unfortunately, they have still not released the text, which means the general public doesn't have access to the U.S. proposals until after the negotiations have concluded and changes to the agreement have become, are, are next to impossible. If we're going to stop the TPP from becoming a massive new NAFTA of the Pacific, we need the text to be released to the public and make sure that our officials, like Senator Ron Wyden, Representatives um, Suzanne Bonamici, Earl Blumenauer, and Kurt Schrader, are hearing our concerns and taking action to get us a good deal, which looks very unlikely at this point. And if we can't get a good deal, then we need to say no deal. And because we need, and because of this, we need to be engaging now before negotiations are over. Um, 
If we can get our elected officials to make demands of negotiators on things like labor standards, public interest over investor rights, access to affordable medication, or whatnot, um, you know, that's a positive for us because it makes life for the negotiated, negotiators much more difficult. They want to rush through a backroom deal. Our job is to prevent that from happening. The good news is that uh, we're not alone in this. Uh, just before the last round of negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there were um, international solidarity events in several cities around the world to protest uh, what many are seeing as a corporate coup. Here in the U.S., people came together to do educational events in 13 cities across the country. The Council of Canadians launched a trade, trade tour that hit at least six cities. And in Australia, unions and community groups held rallies in Sydney and Melbourne. Also, also um, there was a trade rally that took place in Malaysia on May Day. And in Japan, there was a big rally in Tokyo. Um, and in Lima, Peru, where the uh, 17th round of negotiations took place last month, they did an all-day teach-in and demonstration outside of the negotiations. And one thing to remember is that uh, we have some major wins against corporate globalization. This kind of transnational community resistance put a freeze on the WTO. It stopped the free trade area of the Americas, and we can stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership too. Great, thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was very, uh, I think, illuminating. Great, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go right now to uh, and uh, have Benjamin Garretts with the, um, um, tell us who you're with. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Benjamin Garretts. Uh, thank you, David, for inviting me here uh, today. I'm honored to speak with you. Uh, my voice that of a native Portlander, a union leader, an activist, an advocate, and a man living with HIV. The shirt I'm wearing today, I've been told in the past, is hard to miss. Uh, it's that of a Positive Force Northwest member, a community-led group of HIV-positive individuals dedicated to service. As a member of this group, I come before you deeply distressed by the potential implications of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. To illustrate my concerns, I'd like to start with an activity which involves all of you, our viewers. I ask each of our viewers to look among your belongings, to hold up in your hand an item that belongs to you. It could be your phone, your wallet, your purse. Now in holding this item up, imagine that you needed this item to live, that you would die without it. I ask of us, how much would your item be worth to you? I too have in my belongings, and I hold up before you, my HIV medication, a triplet. Now with us holding our item, imagine that a group of affluent people establish an agreement whereby they secretly decide to take it from you. That the value that you place on it, the value of your life, is not the value they've assigned. This is what's at stake with the TPP. This one pill that I have costs $64, or equivalent to $2,000 a month. For this price, one would think it made of solid gold, but for 34 million HIV-positive people across the globe, including me, it might as well be, as many of us would not be here today without it. What's concerning me about this is that it calls into question that which I feel shouldn't have to be asked. How much is our item? How much is our life worth? I've been fortunate in my life. I was diagnosed HIV positive early in my disease progression. I've continued to work full time and I've maintained employer provided health insurance that's afforded me access to this medicine. But what about 23% of our world's population whom live on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day? Just as my salary would be insufficient to pay my uncovered medical bills, so too does excessive medication pricing place millions of lives in peril. 
among 34 HIV positive people globally. A 2012 UN AIDS report noted there's 7 million of us living with HIV in need of this pill who are unable to access it. Why is this? Unfortunately, the answer comes down to money. Despite this troubling realization, there is some good news. Between 2009 and 2011, the same UN AIDS report noted a 60% increase in HIV positive people accessing life-saving treatment between 2005 and 2011. AIDS-related mortality in, in Africa was cut by a third. A large factor contributing to this success has been the mass production of generic HIV medications in India, a country known as the pharmacy of the uh, developing world. India, due to its ro robust uh, uh, competition in the country's medication manufacturing market, has been able to reduce the cost of producing one year's worth of HIV medications for one HIV positive person to the price of the one pill that I have in my hand. $64 for one year's worth. And HIV has not been the only medical condition that's benefited from India's production. Countless lives have been saved across a multiple multitude of uh, diseases, including cancer, TB, and malaria. While it seems as though world governments would be supportive of India's free market medication manufacturing, unfortunately, this is not the case. India's laws have consistently come un under attack by large corporate interests, governments such as the European Union and the World Bank, who continue with judicial actions seeking to re restrict production, who seek to undermine long-term global health for short-sighted stockholder gains. So far, India has been successful in fighting off efforts to undermine its legally justified manufacturing. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is yet another attempt at impos imposing all-encompassing corporate interest standards across countries that differ in approach to economic development. While India is not one of the 11 countries currently negotiating the TPP, this trade policy has been deemed by its supporters to be the model for the 21st century, the model for future trade agreements in the world. I wonder were the TPP to go into effect with its current language, if India would be able to continue to fight off attacks on its manufacturing. I also wonder if this trade agreement were so incredible, why is it that negotiations have been so secretive? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm feeling fabulous, I usually want others around me to know why. One of my union colleagues is famous for the saying, if you're not at the table, you're, you're being served as the lunch. Nowhere is this saying more true than in the TPP negotiations, with corporate interests seated at the table attempting to serve us, the public, as the lunch. Despite their efforts to keep TPP articles secret, fortunately, the public has gained access to portions through leaked copies. TPP chapters highlight that U.S. corporate interests are at the heart of the current agreement. These leaked copies demonstrate that the TPP would roll back internationally held public health safeguards, imposing rules and regulations to keep medicines uh, prices high and out of reach of millions in the Asia-Pacific region. Essentially, this means this would mean were I living with HIV in Vietnam, one of the PAC countries, my choice would become pay the $2,000 a month to survive or likely die. For some uh, perspective, the average income in Vietnam is $150 US a month, so my choice becomes a force of hand. A decision made for me that what I value is not deemed to be of value by the affluent negotiators seated at the uh, table. This is why Doctors Without Borders and many other human rights groups have urged us, have urged the world to advocate against such TPP provisions. This is why 
the TPP trade talks have been so secretive. Many of our viewers may be aware that we are in a hopeful time with respect to the HIV AIDS pandemic. On December 1st, 2012, World AIDS Day, our President Barack Obama called upon us to usher in an AIDS-free generation. The President procla pro uh, proclaimed this citing fighting findings from an international study which was noted as having been the scientific breakthrough of 2012. The study showed that early detection of newly infected HIV positives and early comprehensive treatment not only prevents AIDS deaths, but also can prevent transmission likelihood by as much as 96%. Prevent, pre preventing one new HIV infection not only saves lives, as much as I hate to say it, it saves money. In U.S. terms, preventing one new case of HIV saves an estimated $400,000 in lifetime medical treatment alone. One of the continual challenges to realizing a world without AIDS has always been addressing barriers and scaling up access to HIV treatment, and this also, I, as much as I hate to say it, always seems to come down, come down to a cost. The Global Fund and PEPFAR, President's uh, Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, the two largest entities financially supporting HIV treatment in developing countries, have consistently been underfunded. As I mentioned earlier, of the 34 million people living with HIV, seven million of us are in need of medication, are unable to access it due to cost. Seven million, despite successes in reducing costs of providing treatment through generics. Generics that have largely come from India, with 98% of HIV medications purchased by PEPFAR coming from this pharmacy for the developing world. Now, I respect our president for a great many things, but I don't see how offering support for a current US-led, corporate-minded, Trans-Pacific partnership will make his quoted vision of an AIDS-free generation happen. In fact, the repercussions would likely usher in more new infections and more AIDS-related mortalities. I feel each of us has it within us, the ability to change the world. There's an example from the history of HIV AIDS that shows us the truth in Margaret Mead's words to never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Before HIV medications were made available, there was a small group of people living with HIV many succumbing to complications from AIDS, known as ACT UP, an acronym for AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Perhaps many of our viewers are familiar with their story, recently the focus of a documentary, How to Survive a Plague. ACT UP members lived up to their namesake. They acted up, and they pushed the FDA, the CDC, the US Congress, and the world to take action in addressing HIV AIDS. Their efforts resulted in the FDA changing their approval protocols, which has allowed for fast tracking HIV medications, not only for HIV AIDS, but for a multitude of health conditions. This translated and continues to account for countless lives having been saved. So as to address the question of what can I do, I would say become engaged, get involved. Whether this takes the form of talking with others about the dangers of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or filling out online petitions currently available on Doctors Without Borders website. We now have a variety of ways with which we can act upon these issues. Perhaps a phone call to your congressional delegation, perhaps attending a local rally. The choice is ours. Together, we can either opt to be silent 
accepting decisions made by those who place profit before human life, or we can take a stand to be the change we wish to see in the world. Great, thank you very much, both of you. And I really appreciate the fact that you're talking about this. Usually when we talk about the effects of free trade agreements and why we should be opposed to them, whether it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership or NAFTA or CAFTA or any of the other alphabet soup uh, agreements that we've had thrust upon us, we usually hear arguments with regard to how it affects labor, how it affects the environment, how it affects sometimes democracy. Uh, we have almost never heard how it affects medicine and access to medicine. I really appreciate you bringing this to the fore. Great. Uh, unfortunately, we are almost out of time. I want to ask you, give us a quick timeline for the future progress of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Sure. Um, so the Obama administration has set forth a rather ambitious deadline of October this year. Now, um, whether or not that uh, deadline is met is yet to be seen, but it's very, very clear that the negotiators are taking it very seriously and negotiations are kicking into high gear. Um, and the big worry for us right now is fast track. Um, we have, like I said, the big businesses really pushing to make sure fast track is in place so that they can slide this through. Um, so the time to be acting is right now. Okay. All right. And so, uh, what would you recommend people do? Or, or let's 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 talk about fast track. What is fast track? Before we so okay. fast track is federal legislation um, that basically limits Congress's power to an up or down vote. So the regular processes and checks and balances <clears throat> that most legislation goes through doesn't apply to trade policy. Trade policy, which affects a broad range of issues that we just talked about. All right, very good. Good. Thank you, Benjamin, for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Okay, good. And Elizabeth, thank you. So our guests today have been Elizabeth Swagger, who is the executive director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign, and Benjamin Garretts of the Prevention with Positives Coordinator at the Cascade AIDS Project here in Portland. Uh, as Elizabeth said, if you want to take action on the TPP, I highly encourage you to do this. Call your member of Congress today and urge them to push the administration to release the Trans-Pacific Partner text so we know what in the world is in it and to oppose any attempt to, and to oppose any attempt to impose a fast track authority. So the number for Congress is 202-224-3121. I want to thank our volunteers who volunteer their time to get our program on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Beth Kerwin, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope you'll watch us again next week. Bye.